when you think about it, in your visual landscape with animals, you see them for months, years, and plants. So you have a f familiarity factor. But mushrooms that come up and disappear in four or five days, some of them can feed you, some can kill you, some can heal you, some can send you on a spiritual journey. So to have something so powerful and yet so ephemeral, uh, it's natural for humans to avoid that which they don't understand out of fear because they don't know the difference. But you know, 23 primates consume mushrooms, humans being one of them. And so that speaks to a long ancestral use of mushrooms going back, you know, in our primate ev evolutionary tree for a very, very long time. We separated from fungi 650 million years ago. Maybe you did, dude. I know some people that are probably still. <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> we, we, we are des it's descendants uh, of fungi. Yeah. Um, we share a more common ancestry with fungi than we do with any other kingdom. And fungi are closer to animals than they are to plants. Animals came from fungi. Whoa. You and I are actually fungal bodies. Oof. I'm speaking to basically another fungal body right now. Okay. Uh, and from a cellular point of view, under the microscope, uh, human cells, animal cells, and fungal cells are very, very similar. We exhale carbon dioxide, we inhale oxygen. And it's really interesting that the, the many of the bacterial diseases that infect fungi also infect us. Our best antibiotics against bacteria come from fungi, penicillin being the obvious oh. example. You know, the universe was created about 13.8 billion years ago from the Big Bang. The Earth coalesced out of stardust about 4.5 billion. The, er the earliest records of life we have is about 3.8 billion years ago, single-celled uh, 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 single celled organisms. But just recently in lava beds in South Africa, they found mycelium infused through the lava 2.4 billion years ago. Now, we split from uh, fungi 650 million years ago. And then in Brazil this past year, they found a fully intact, uh, apparently a fossilized mushroom published in Nature, which is a very, very reputable scientific journal. And that one is 1.4 billion years old. So the oldest multicellular organism in the fossil record today is this fungus and lava in South Africa 2.4 billion years ago. A fully formed mushroom who had its form uh, grew, uh, was growing 1.4 billion years ago. We were, we separated from fungi 650 million years ago. Mushrooms have had their form longer than we've had our form by more than a billion years. But think of that, mushrooms had their form before we had ours. Yeah. These are elders. These are, these are ancient organisms. These are the, really the, the overlord underlords of our ecosystem. And I suspect, and as these neural networks, they have more neural connections in the mycelial mass, they're, th they're over a thousand acres than we have in our brain. They are actually accumulating knowledge, genetic intelligence. But I think that as time goes on, I hope that we will be able to interface with them. Because I think that there is, a, there is many benefits of us communicating with mycelium that can give us um, rapid responses to catastrophia. That's how they've evolved. And we're now the biggest walking catastrophe that I know, walking across the planet. And we need to engage these fungal allies for the benefits that we need to put into play in order to prevent uh, the loss of biodiversity. It seems like a communication gap would be very hard to bridge. The communication gap, I mean, if we really did find a way to communicate in some form with mushrooms, like the concept of language, like you were talking about just the idea of nature and intelligence and these words that we have, that we have these uh, sort of uh, uh, concrete definitions in our head that don't really apply to some things that are very, very confusing to us, like the idea of fungal intelligence, the idea that you could somehow or another understand the language that these things, we don't, even, we don't even understand dolphin language, right? Well, one classic example, uh, Example: uh, Japanese uh, are so clever at this. They, um, there's a slime mold, you know, um, called Physarium uh, polycephalum. And they had a, uh, and this slime mold is very, very good at navigating through mazes and challenges. I mean, first to food wins, you know, the conservation of energy, you know, is rewarded. So, you so don't how do they set this up? They like, they well, put a little bit of it. <laughs> they, they did several experiments. The, the fun, most fun one is they, um, they designed uh, a nutrient, um, uh, basically a nutrient like maize um, replicating um, Tokyo in the Japanese subway system. 
And uh, so they started with Tokyo and they put uh, oats, which is a nutritional source. They inoculated what is on this basically an agar map um, with all the major cities, the nodes around Tokyo. And they then make each of those nodes had a piece of oat on them, which was a source of nutrition. The main uh, oat uh, was where Tokyo was. They inoculated it. And then they let the slime mold then grow. And first it grew out randomly, exploratorily, you know, just like you would do if you're a hunter or something, you're hunting on the landscape looking for things. And then after about 28 hours, it reorganized itself in the most efficient way possible and reorganized the Japanese subway system in a more efficient manner than it's designed today. Thus, they, they said, not me, not Paul Stamets, this is a demonstration of cellular intelligence. Whoa. So this is the tip of the proverbial mycelial iceberg. You know, this is, uh, has broad implications. And I just want people to suspend their disbelief. And this goes into it, actually the evolution of human consciousness. And Terrence McKenna was a good friend of mine. I love Terrence. I especially loved him the last five years of his life because he made fun of himself so much. Terence and Dennis both came up with a stain, stoned ape theory. Now, it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. A hypothesis is speculative, uh, but cannot necessarily be, as not yet proven. A theory is a hypothesis that has been tested and proven with facts. So I disagree with them in saying it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. But the hypothesis of the stoned ape, uh, 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 of the stoned ape which I think you've alluded to before, is that with climate change and as the savannas increase and our primate ancestors came out of the, out of the forest canopies, they're, they're tracking across the savannah. And if you're a hunter, what do you look? You look for footsteps and you look for scat. Uh, and the most significant fleshy mushroom going out of poop in, in Africa, hippopotamus, elephant, you know, uh, deer, antelope, et cetera, um, is Slossoby cubensis. It's a very large mushroom. You're hungry. You're with your clan. You consume it. And then 20 minutes later, you're, you are catapulted in this extraordinary experience. Psilocybin substitutes as serotonin, becomes a better tr neurotransmitter, activates neurogenesis. It causes new neurons to form, new pathways of knowledge. So that's a stone date hypothesis. And it speaks to a mystery uh, that the human brain uh, basically, the brain cavity doubled in size in about two million years. Some people say it's less, as two, uh, less than two hundred thousand. Homo sapiens less arrived, than two hundred thousand years. Yeah. Homo sapiens arrived uh, two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand years ago. That's a big gap, right? It's a, it's a big gap. Well, the science is like that. So mm. you want, you know, to be scientifically accurate here, I need to show the the extreme margins of what's been estimated. So if we accept two million years that. The, and it's shown in the fossil record, this is true, the oldest Homo sapiens fossils are 300,000 years old now. Um, but we have a subtle, suddenly doubling of the human brain. Um, and with that, our language centers increased, our ability to prognosticate, to plan. Um, and there's no explanation for this uh, currently. And even though we may not be able to prove it, I ask people to suspend their disbelief for a second. Now think of this. Our primate ancestors are going across the savanna. They ingest these mushrooms as a clan. Massive input for anyone who's eaten these mushrooms. Huge amounts of data is coming in. Fractal patterns, geometrical you know, landscapes occur. Uh, you have empathy. Uh, you have greater courage. You're fighting a saber-toothed saber, saber tiger. You know, one day you're, you have a fear of it. Uh, we know now from neurogenesis and the extension of the fear response that has been clinically proven, psilocybin allows you to reset and have different neurological pathways to respond to fear, overcoming the fear of conditioned response, potentially PTSD, and there's a lot of research on this currently. So, but this wouldn't happen one time with one hominid group. It wouldn't happen two times, ten times. It happened millions and millions and millions and millions of times over millions and millions of years. This leads to what I think is called, uh, this should be called epigenetic neurogenesis. We know that there's a regeneration of neurons. We know that soul substitutes the serotonin. It opens the floodgates of the senses. You have a lot more data coming in. And we know that it has the extinction of the, of the fear response. So if you're the leader of your clan, you've had this traumatic uh, event, either war or 
cataclysm, from earthquakes, whatever the case may be, or encounter a saber-toothed tiger, whatever, if you're the leader of that clan and you can overcome your fear response, you have courage and you have empathy. Those are leadership skills. I think we people should take note of it. People like to follow leaders who are courageous and yet kind, who they can trust. They'll have their best interests in mind. So I think this propelled, I think it's a lot, it's a very good explanation. It's an unprovable hypothesis. But now we're at a junction and, for the ne and we're ready for the next quantum leap in human consciousness. I think psilocybin should be looked upon as a nootropic vitamin.